All right, so I would like to begin uh, today's session by acknowledging the Wangal people, the traditional custodians of the land on which I stand today, as well as the traditional custodians of all the other lands from which we are meeting. I pay my respects to First Nations elders past and present, and I extend that respect to any First Nations people joining us today. Um, just a reminder for everybody uh, as you join the call to, to stay on mute. Um, so, uh, look, welcome to the 10th in our series of Smart Places Masterclasses, which uh, rounds out the, the series as, as we had planned it. Um, we've covered a wide range of topics so far from public trust through to Internet of Things, and we've been building towards a full day summit next Tuesday, the 22nd of June. Um, this series has been such a unique opportunity to hear from a variety of very credentialed speakers uh, with even more to come at the summit next week. So I hope everybody out there has registered to, to watch and listen next Tuesday. Um, today's focus is investment in smart places. Um, great news for everybody listening is that we will actually have two more bonus sessions that, to follow after the summit. So um, two more topics have been added to this to this series, which is 6G disruption and opportunities on the 6th of July and quantum computing with a, a date to be confirmed in late July. I'd like to thank our host ACS and Mark Portlock for all his hard work organising these sessions um, and our speakers today for giving up their time and sharing their knowledge with us all. I will introduce them individually when we get into it, but first of all, some housekeeping. Um, this evening's event is being recorded. Uh, and will be available on the ACS Masterclass YouTube channel. Uh, the links will all be provided at the end of the session in the chat, so keep an eye out for that. Um, please do stay on mute throughout the session, but we'll have a few um, periods uh, in between speakers to ask questions. We'll ask you to do that in the chat. Please just type, type your question briefly in chat and we'll then invite you to come off mute and ask your question in case you want to add a bit more detail. Please do introduce yourself when you, when you do that so we know where you're coming from. OK, um, so our speakers today are just I hope I'm getting this order right. We've got Meredith Hodgman first, followed by Michael Komninos and uh, Jason D'Souza closing us out. Um, so first off, I will introduce Meredith. Meredith is an associate director of place and partnerships at KPMG the Smart Cities Chair for the Internet of Things Alliance Australia and the co-founder and international director of Women in Smart Cities Global. Meredith has a background in law, sustainable transport and digital transition. She's passionate about catalyzing sector convergence for the cities of the future and has 15 plus years of international experience in trade and investment, benchmarking and forecasting next generation technology trends for urban, economic, environmental and social efficiencies. Meredith sits on the G20 Smart Cities Alliance PPP task force the Future of Place Global Advisory Board, the New South Wales Spatial Digital Twin Special Interest Group, and she currently sits on the New South Wales Smart Places Industry Advisory Panel. So bringing all of this experience to her presentation today, really excited to introduce Meredith. Um, I'll hand over to you, Meredith, and then we'll do some questions afterwards. Hi, Kelly, thanks for that. Always slightly awkward to hear yourself introduced, but um, hopefully I can figure out how to work teams. I think that's probably going to be the critical pin for today. Mark, I might try once to do it from my end once more. I've done a little minor adjustment here, and then if that doesn't work, would you be kind to step in for me, or is that, are you comfortable with that? Sure. A few technical challenges on the setup earlier, everyone. And I just say it's absolutely lovely to see some familiar names in that box there. Um, Lauren uh, in particular, Narelle, wonderful to see you today. Um, I'm just trying to switch to presenter mode and I'm not having a lot of luck. Here we go. Here we go. Is that view all right for everybody? It's looking great on our end, Meredith. Thanks. Okay, so what I was going to do just to kick us all off is to ask if everybody could use the Teams function to do a quick little show of hands if you are not from the public sector. So in other words, if you're from the private sector, click your little hand icon just so that everybody can get a feel for who's in the room. Um, it, from my perspective, it will dictate whether I skim across some slides a little bit, um, but it's also just a nice quick way to get a pulse check of, of where we are and who we are. Um, so why you do that? I will uh, throw over to the concept today. I'm introducing uh, social value, in particular unlocking social value in our smart cities investments. 
Um, I think we can all agree that smart cities around the world are multiplying, um, but I do think it's time we asked ourselves, why aren't they scaling? Why aren't they replicating? Why aren't they delivering measurable social impact? So as a part of that today, we're going to talk about what is social impact, are the conditions right to start talking about that at the moment, and perhaps if anything's missing. So uh, infrastructure projects have a critical role to play in achieving the UN SDGs. It's across the board. The 2018 report by Oxford found that both networked and non-networked infrastructure investment will contribute to achieving up to 80% of the sustainable development targets. The bottom line is that while we know there's $68.5 trillion planned investment infrastructure globally over the next two decades, there is comparatively very little investment in preventative measures for addressing the critical social issues that go along with it. Yet we know that critical social issues have a significant economic cost uh, and not to mention a personal cost. So while the digital revolution is offering unprecedented windows of opportunities to improve the lives of millions of urban residents, there's absolutely no guarantee that that rapid diffusion of new technologies will automatically benefit our citizens. Smart cities need smart governance. Business and contractual models need to adapt to rapidly changing urban environments and encompass a more holistic approach. In an era of intersecting and persistent policy changes, coupled with a need to deliver more tailored public services in an increasingly constrained fiscal environment, many of our local governments are rethinking how to better leverage capacity in terms of human, financial, institutional, physical and community resources to serve our residents. This presents us with an opportunity to promote integrated contracts. Smart cities of all sizes need to promote an agile and flexible model of governance through innovative collaboration tools, partnerships and contracts that put interests of local residents at the centre, including through municipal collaboration and particularly through public-private partnerships. So what is social impact? Uh, fundamentally, social impacts are consequences experienced by people, both positive and negative. Importantly, understanding them helps us to enable investors to ensure that their investments are delivering social value to the community. And ultimately, uh, these experiences can have a significant impact on adoption, on, on adoption, success and costs of a smart city project. But really what matters the most is that we're actually making the effort to identify the elements of value to people who are likely to be effective, whether they are quantifiable or not. So at a high level, social impact can significantly enhance diversity, equity and inclusion outcomes by uh, enhancing people's ways of life, community, access to and use of infrastructure, culture, including shared beliefs, customs and values, physical and mental health, their surroundings, livelihoods, decision-making processes, fears and aspirations. This uh, excerpt, Concepts of Social Value, is taken from a report by Jacobs called A Blueprint to Social Value. We'll touch on that a few times throughout the paper um, presentation today. And at the end of the slide, there's a end of the presentation, there's a short slide on the resources that are available to people who want to be able to learn more about the, um, the work that I'm presenting. Um, for full transparency. So furthermore, on top of the, um, the opportunity here is that the market size of global smart city industries is really not slowing down. And we know that COVID has only accelerated the digital governance uptake. Of the anticipated growth, notably 70% of smart city growth potential lies in cities that have less than a million dollar per year investments. But these large figures with M's and B's after them are only aspirational if we can't build social value into our smart city projects to realise the full potential of smart cities, we have to focus our efforts on social impact. And I think the time is now. I think smart city pilots are everywhere and could be expanded to achieve broad policy goals. Some innovative projects that are currently tested as pilot projects enjoy special conditions in terms of budget, human resources and regulatory frameworks, which will soon be no longer available when their projects and their pilots are wound up. So the time is turning though, and I think that recent moves by the New South Wales government to centralise ICT spending and to consolidate digital service delivery have been mirrored by the federal government and coupled with major investment into digital infrastructure, cataloguing data assets and intergovernmental collaboration. It was really interesting to see this budget that over 50% of the total digital economy package was committed to improving the enabling conditions of government's data capabilities. This signals a significant shift in government for all levels in Australia, which will be a precursor to smart city market growth. However, to put it into perspective, 
the national digital spend commitment is still actually less than 0.1% of Australia's entire projected budget spending in the same time frame. And the national digital spend is less than the New South Wales state commitment to digital. So where New South Wales has 1.6 billion invested, the federal government's only got 1.2 billion. So we're seeing the tide turn, but we know that we have to be smarter with what the money that we have and the effort that we're doing into it. And I would call this a call to action really for us all to learn from our existing pilots and for governments to be brave enough to find forums where it's safe for government to fail fast. We don't need to recreate the wheel, we just need to improve on it. So the New South Wales Smart Places Acceleration Program is a really good example where government is helping place owners, including councils, agencies, et cetera, to apply innovative technologies to uh, how we live, live and breathe in our places. The Smart Places Acceleration Program, facilitated by a $45 million fund um, over three years, accelerates the development of smart places across New South Wales. And what you see here are the six pillars of smart places strategy. I think it's a great example where social value has been prescribed by policy, and we now hope to see that parlay through the co-investment fund. Um, so the co-investment that I talk about here is coupled with matched investment in particular to deliver outcomes. And it takes a fairly um, brave approach, I think, for government to do a co-design approach and crowd surf ideas rather than being overly prescriptive. Interestingly, it requires a bit of a moonshot think and problem and asks problem solvers to partner with state agencies to deliver change where governments can't do it alone. And this is important, um, particularly because uh, the program seeks to Sorry, <laughs> this is important deliberately because it's highlighting co-design as an emerging norm in infrastructure investment in particular. But when we do this, when we and we see it around the world happening, whether it's through service design, whether it's through um, participatory government, etc., what we are now asking the question of is who is ultimately responsible for social value in this scenario? So the value, social value, must be defined in the business case. I think we often forget that PPPs aren't the only way we can deliver our, our smart city investments. PPP is actually just the delivery model. And unless we're defining value in the business case through pre-procurement, we're never really going to see those outcomes. Pre-procurement, importantly, is also fully in the government space. It cannot be left up to the private sector alone. So if we aren't seeing social value from, let's say, modern PPPs and smart cities, then you could argue it's a market failure. So when we consider social impacts in a business case, it can allow us to ask important questions like, what do communities need? And how can the benefits be maximised and spread equitably? Using these types of questions to influence the design and scope of the project, at the same time as we consider whether the economics are stacking up, ensures that we're not going to lose sight of why we're going to make that investment in the first place. This less than attractive slide is taken from Deloitte, the challenge of paying for smart cities. And I've overlaid a couple of ring loops there to articulate out where the different roles for the players sit and to highlight that co-design space again around considering funding and finance options. But for my, my conversation today, I'm going to focus on phase one, understanding the project and project value. In particular, looking at the different, considering the ways that we can think about direct value capture, indirect value capture, and various forms of asset recycling within a smart city context. Um, it really illustrates the three phases of smart city investment, I think, and it shows here in particular that's where the social value is going to come out of. We can't just look to phase three, we can't just look to our developers and expect them to be delivering on social value. Again, drawing on the Jacob social value blueprint, this blurring of responsibilities requires new collaborations. I really like this model because it articulates what each section of the community is actually fundamentally responsible for delivering and what they might actually also be facing in terms of a risk. So the financially sustainable business models is something that businesses and private sector certainly can contribute to and can inform. And I think quite often we'll find that communities, suppliers and entrepreneurs need this space, this agency to experiment with and test and prove innovative approaches to generating that social value. We are really wading through new territory. So fundamentally, the value creation is happening in the pre-procurement phase. A smart city pre-procurement requires additional consideration, such as data, to determine the full social value, though. We really just can't use infrastructure or ICT PPP guidelines, or business case guidelines, I should say. 
So um, without tailoring the smart city business case, we lack the ability to account for or to measure the full benefits or ROI in the investment. We are lowering our ability to draw on the full gambit of finance options that are available. Um, and ultimately, while triple bottom line guidance does exist for infrastructure projects in business case development, such as the New South Wales Social Impact Assessment Guidelines, unfortunately, establishing a business case is not as simple or straightforward as plugging the numbers into a template. So, okay, so theoretically, you've ascertained that a public-private partnership is in fact the best delivery model for your investment. And you know that you want to build a business case to capture as much social value as possible and to attract the best stakeholders, partners, and investors. But where do you start? Well, the short answer for a smart city project is that we are all in new territory. We're all learning and it's all experimental. And even drawing from global, state, or federal examples, most guidance notes are outdated written a decade ago with no provision for data, privacy or broader implications or opportunities that arise from social impact. It's time for an update and with a little hope we might see some guidance come out from Infrastructure Australia in their reform series paper later this year and hopefully from the G20 Smart Cities Alliance who are currently developing a model policy on PPPs for smart cities. Um, the closest guidance found for developing a pre-procurement business case that incorporates social value in infrastructure was actually the Federal ICT Business Case Guide. So I keep coming back to pre-procurement and in phase one of this public-private partnership investment sort of life cycle phase. And I think it's really important to just call out the fundamentals, which is that the business case is a key tool to inform evidence-based investment decisions by government. It's as simple as that. The objectives of doing this really help to make sure that what we're doing is well considered, that the risks are shared, but importantly, that we're also achieving government priorities and objectives across the board. So there's no, without limited, sorry, with the lack of guidance that's available out there to help incorporate social value into PPPs, especially in the context of technology, diversity, equity, and inclusion, we find ourselves looking to other sectors to consider how we might be able to, to approach design uh, our programs. Um, you've got an example there from that um, ICT business case uh, guide. I like that example particularly because it broke down by user, so it really helped people to think through the problem at hand. But what I'd like to show you today is one called a city canvas model. Um, for those of you who have ever worked in service design, you might be familiar with the business model canvas from which this takes a lot of, um, lends a lot from. The canvas essential element is the value proposition. And hopefully you can see on your screen there that there's a number of boxes. Uh, the value proposition sits at the centre of the document. It's number two. Um, this, and it, it calls the person filling out this document to think through collaboratively with all of the stakeholders what the specific benefits are and what the specific problems proposed can be alleviated. Except you can only achieve that once you've been through all of the different boxes on this particular template. And so it becomes that co-design process and it forces people to think through and to evidentiate the various benefits from a variety of different perspectives. It's incorporating indirect and direct benefits into the community to support a holistic development of a business case in the next phase. Please excuse my typos. <laughs> so I would actually probably call this a pre-pre-procurement template, and I think it's a really fantastic example. The City of Bristol used it quite recently to pull together their ICT platform, and I thought from the lessons learned that they had shared, it would be really nice to chat through them there. I'm not going to spend a lot of time waiting around in how they've actually populated this template here ultimately, because I think it's very specific to a very particular project, but you could use this template for a variety of different things. Um, the three main strengths that the City of Bristol reported on using this tool were that it really helped them to identify stakeholders, but in particular to identify them early. Um, users reported the best feature was the collaborative input into the development of the value prop. The Canvas' essential element, because the ICT platform was still in the planning phase, the value proposition was the result of the managers and the stakeholders' expectations. Secondly, the exercise showed that one of the primary uses was this beneficiary identification. So most of the discussions between the workshops that they held when they filled this out were focused on identifying partners, vetoing partners, and talking through the benefits from a variety of different perspectives. And finally, the canvas showed the City of Bristol the difficulty of considering the potential environmental and social impacts of the ICT platform. And although I wasn't able to share a case study with you today, and unfortunately Liam was not able to join us today, I would just like to mention that the City of Sydney has been using this uh, methodology themselves in their smart city projects. 
And it was a really useful experience um, for the teams because you start out when you're solving a problem uh, within your own individual business unit, but when you're forced to consider it through the lens of this canvas, it forces you to engage with different, not just different business units, but also different uh, public sector, private sector, sorry, public stakeholders throughout the process as well. And what it meant was that once the work was done, the thinking was done, we're then able to plug a lot of this information into the existing government templates that we are required in order to access various major investment or infrastructure project uh, approvals. But it was this pre-pre-procurement work that really helped to dig out the social value that came from the various pro projects. So interestingly, and this government is defining the outcomes here, that they would like to effectively buy or purchase, if you will, through an investment, no matter what the delivery model, they're not going to make it into the business case. So while we're experimenting, it's important to still keep some core principles in mind. Start with the end in mind. Define the value and the desired outcomes of the project. Get clarity around the ultimate objectives that you're trying to achieve and the needs that you're trying to address. Um, this is really necessary to attract the best investors. You need to be able to inventory your available assets and think outside the box. Take stock of the assets that you have at your disposal. Are there assets that could be recycled? Are there assets on the roofs of your car parks? Uh, is the data being appropriately considered as an asset? Once the, once the government has identified what you're actually permitted to do with those assets and who owns the ownership of those assets for part of the deal, then you can go on to the next step of figuring out how to actually collaborate. So understanding that business model, mapping out the whole of life cycle business model. Um, one of my favourite quotes has come from a, a, the mayor of the city of Dijon in France, where he said, CapEx is the enemy of innovation as they were implementing their Dijon smart city project. Ultimately, if you don't map out the whole life cycle in your business model, then you'll never be able to realise the benefits fully and to show that value to go back and get more money from the CapEx budget. So for some time, I've really wanted to raise this question. It's early thoughts, but for me, I feel like driven by multinational corporations and fancy widgets, that smart cities has been a market failure for quite some time. It's deliberately provocative, yes. Um, I think too often we don't see governments decide what they would like the private sector to pay for as an ancillary side project in smart cities. Too often we see people solving a specific problem and defining an outcome rather than considering what else could be improved or who else might benefit from participating. So it's not always about prescribing explicitly. It's really important that you pull out tactics like incentives or extra development rights, etc., to be more effective measures than pushing, uh, sorry, pull, sorry, push tactics. So pull tactics like tax incentives are going to bring that private sector along with you because you can't just expect the developer to deliver everything unless you incentivize it. And I hope that we might hear some more from Jason and Michael on this a little bit later. Um, so as a couple of little examples to wind up here, um, with average daily temperatures in Singapore rarely falling below 30 degrees, um, we saw a lot of attempts to bring together different types of design standards to incentivise the better use of public space. Um, the URA in Singapore introduced these design standards in 2017 and ultimately developers who were happy to include private public spaces in their projects, even if they weren't required to do, do so, qualified for additional gross floor area in their, product, in their project um, with an exemption if the property was frequented by the public or situated along popular, popular routes. Full disclosure, you're not looking at a picture of Singapore, you're looking at my favourite train station in Stockholm where they've utilised art in their public space or um, my favourite uh, basketball stadium in Hong Kong, which is like just on the roof of a regular, um, I think it's actually on the roof of a library, but it's just, you know, one of these things where they've found different ways to be creative with their public space. Um, green incentives, I think green roofs is probably another really classic example of how governments can use incentives to bring the private sector into the investment to deliver ancillary benefits for social value. Toronto, for example, introduced new laws for buildings or extensions greater than 21,000 square feet decades ago. Um, other cities have opted for more flexibility in, in what they're going to do and what they're doing. So despite Toronto's laws, they reported that uh, between 20 and 60% of their buildings um, had to have vegetation and that developers could actually opt out for a fee if they would like. I think some people will probably find that to be quite um, a deterrent in terms of development in Australia and it's not particularly flexible. So in San Francisco, we see another example where the incentive was less about opting out of the fee and more about um, uh, giving them a bandwidth between 15 and 30% of their rooftop space had to include green roofs or solar panels, so not the whole thing. 
Whereas in America, we see also, again, Washington stormwater regulation and Philadelphia's tax and tax credit schemes to encourage green roofs. I think these are really cool because ultimately what they're doing is they're attracting modern tenants. So as we're trying to design and develop diverse mixed use spaces that we all want to be live and spend our time in, we don't just want the same types of tenants there. And I'll probably um, pull out a very simple example from the city of Sydney where I think it was a Mervac development where they've currently got the first Indigenous green rooftop farm in what is ultimately a business park district. And it's a really great example about how with various incentives you can not only deliver social value in terms of offsets for carbon or green roofs and sustainability, but what you're really doing is bringing diverse different um, stakeholders and members to live and utilise in that space. Um, okay, so a very specific project example here, one of my favourite ones. Um, for those of you who are missing the ability to travel globally, uh, big architects in Denmark uh, have implemented the world's first cleanest waste to energy power plant in the world. Um, and they've put on a ski slope on top of it. And that's an all year round ski slope. So you can see that you can do the uh, simulated grass ski slope during the summer months. And then the, uh, you can ski down it on a snow field for the remaining 11 months of the year that is freezing in Denmark. Um, but it's one of these types of things that really helps the big architects win that project proposal against all the other competitors. Um, and the tender documents for that are really quite interesting in terms of how the, the city of Copenhagen actually asked the private sector to, to offer up any social value that they could in a completely open gambit. Um, and then I think almost last, is this is another creative one and uh, controversially not from Sydney, but from the city of Melbourne. Um, Troy Innocent, who uh, is at RMIT at the moment, um, was um, commissioned to do this uh, installation on the outside of a tram. So as cities are running on information, finding ways to get the public to proactively engage with infrastructure provides us with a wealth of information and metrics about how that infrastructure is being used. Um, so running along Melbourne's uh, Route 96 from East Brunswick to St Kilda Beach, the tram was designed by uh, Dr Troy Innocent, who is a games and interactivity expert. And the artwork features a geometric design that incorporates augment, uh, augmented reality television. So when the tram goes past, you scan it with your phone and it plays music. So it's actually um, like music notes on the side of the tram. But what it also did was um, communicated safety messages so that as children were pausing to use the tram, they were getting safety messages. And so that the public transport sector was, I think actually, sorry, the city in that instance was getting an idea about where people were waiting and you know, um, how close they were to the tram and that type of safety information. I think that's also really important to talk about the fact that play in cities is a, is a social value in its own right. Play is inclusive, regardless of age or language. Um, it connects communities together, especially in ages of isolation. Uh, it helps educate on safety. It engages directly from governments to citizens as well. I mean, anyone who's ever worked in government knows it's not always particularly easy to do that. Um, and it speaks to a broader trend in participatory design and the participatory citizen. So to summarise, a few key takeaways were thinking outside the box, making sure you're considering unused assets, making sure that you're looking at non-competitive partner value. So just because you don't value the exterior of the tram doesn't mean that somebody else might not. Um, don't recreate the wheel. We need to do experiential, experiential failing and we need to do it fast. Um, ensuring governments taking a lead role in defining value and outcomes and that we're incentivizing the private sector to appropriately help deliver social value outcomes. And finally, the, the importance or the real challenge, if you will, about not, um, not bringing in social value is that we're not actually capturing the full benefit realization of the investments that we're doing. So um, the last slide here is just a quick wrap of the resources. Um, three key reports that I drew from were the World Economic Forums, Social Inclusive Growth, New South Wales Social Impact Assessment Guidelines are very good, uh, and Building Queensland Guides. And Mark will share these slides after the presentation, I think, so you'll be able to come back on those at a later time. Um, but in, the, in a world where we are still defining everything, I would encourage everybody to read what we can, learn what we can. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Meredith. 
That was a lot of information in a very short space of time. We, we squeezed all of that into half an hour, which is fantastic. Um, what we'll do is open up um, for a few questions um, in between speakers. So if you do have a question, could you please pop it into the chat now? And I'll just get us started um, by asking Meredith one of mine uh, to give you a bit of time to, to type away. Um, so Meredith, you mentioned benefits being overlooked. Um, I'm, I'm really curious in your experience, what sorts of outcomes or benefits from smart cities do you think are most often overlooked, either because they can't be quantified or because they just are not obvious? You know, I actually think it's almost because they're too obvious. So a great example would be that you want to pull together a um, an immersive technology experience for visitor economy, right? And so you're really focused on your visitor economy. You're really focused on understanding augmented technology. You're really focused on your stakeholders. And then you don't think about, extra extra benefits like actually what about people with English as a second language they might not be visitors but they always live here so unless you kind of force yourself to go through uh, some type of methodology or you're using guidance and templates it's not easy to always pick the obvious because you know our communities are so multicultural in Australia there are hundreds and thousands of our, our residents that don't actually speak English every single day of their lives a really good example of that analogy is also um, how neighbourlytics the type of technology that Navalytics applies when they look at social media. You can have a look at how many people in Sydney using our trains at the moment aren't actually tweeting or using Instagram in English. So these, these types of ancillary benefits are kind of the known unknown, if you will, I call them. We know about them, but we are so focused on our particular um, remit and responsibility that we don't always broaden our lens to capture the full value of our work. So that, that sort of leads me to think that there's there's probably a lot of opportunities in what's actually already out there that may not be realised as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, For a sector, it's really hard because, you know, we were talking about how hard it is to get funding or get money or, to, you know, to really catalyse what we're trying to achieve. But actually, if we made the time and the effort to quantify what we're already achieving, it would build the business case and mount the rationale, not just for government funding, but to attract other investors to really understand, you know, other stakeholders and private sector investors to the table. So on a, on a related note, um, with the with the increasing sort of openness of of data, um, particularly with the the New South Wales government open data portal, um, and the trend towards digital services through COVID and more generally, um, I would love to know what are some of the big shifts you've seen that you're most excited about that can start to help build these business cases. You're just on me there. Yeah, look, I think this intersection of when you look around, so we can look at guidance from ICT sector, we can look at guidance from infrastructure sector. But what I'm actually really excited about is looking at the shifts in the utilities sector because, you know, whether or not it's about water, energy, um, 5G, whatever, wireless, you know, accessibility in itself can be really, is really critical. That's like everybody needs access to those. Those are essential services. And when we start to utilise the hardware, like the poles or, you know, anything else, and we're looking at different models of sharing, that's when things get really fun. So a little bit like we've sort of, we're moving towards this one-stop shop for service delivery um, for government services, well, the citizen doesn't really necessarily care if it's the water provider the same as the energy provider, etc. So I think there's a lot of benefits to be realised in there, economic, environmental and social. So, yeah, I'm a bit excited about utilities in the circular economy. Very cool. Thank you, Meredith. Oh, look, we haven't had any questions from the audience yet, but I have a bit of a feeling that they might start to come out as we move to our other speakers because we've got some some quite different, I wouldn't say different perspectives, just different different angles on the same topic here, which is uh, which I'm really excited about. So I will get on and introduce our next speaker. Um, we have My Michael Komninos up next. So Michael has over 17 years of experience developing and implementing strategy, policy and regulatory reform in uh, planning and infrastructure. His unique mix of skills and experience has allowed him to develop insights into how to work across all levels of government and industry to develop tangible benefits for citizens. Michael is a nationally recognised infrastructure planner, having advised local, state and national governments in Australia and New Zealand. He's pioneered data-driven approaches to planning using GIS, Internet of Things and artificial intelligence to generate insights using near real-time information. 
Michael was the lead negotiator on behalf of eight councils in Western Sydney for the Western Sydney City Deal. He is an advisor to over 40 councils across Australia in South Australia, Victoria, Queensland and New South Wales. Michael's previous experience in the New South Wales public sector includes the Greater Sydney Commission Infrastructure, New, sorry, <laughs> comma, Greater Sydney Commission Infrastructure New South Wales and the then Department of Planning and Infrastructure. So Michael, you're going to talk to us a little bit about precincts as part of this investment topic. Take it away. Okay, bear with me. We have to have the uh, ceremonial play with IT just to get the deck up. Okay. Just to start from the beginning. All right. Kelly, can you see that? Looks perfect. Looks perfect. I like All how right. you began with the end in mind and followed Meredith's yeah, advice. Yeah. Spot on. All right. Um, so in positioning what I'm going to take you through, um, I've taken a bit of license to focus on the different perspectives of the people who sit around the table for a transaction. Uh, and while we're talking about precincts, I think um, a lot of the content here is relevant regardless of scale, um, whether it's a particular site or project right through to a, a regional context. So as you can see there, um, understanding the public sector and the private sector so that you do get a transaction that's in the interest of both parties. And a little bit about us. Uh, Kelly, thank you for the introduction. Um, we're, a, we're a firm that does uh, advisory for both government and industry. Um, we do a lot of work in the innovation sector, uh, but also how you actually engage in the change management that's required to deploy and realise the benefits of that innovation. So the uh, the outline of, of my uh, 15 minutes or 20 minutes, um, Look, rolling through the promise of digital and the importance of scale, I don't think, I don't think that's discussed enough. Um, the role of government, industry deployment models, um, the topics of, of a pilot and going beyond an engineering question to a financial question, and that will touch on some of the things that Meredith uh, just mentioned and also what Jason is likely to discuss. Um, and then the ongoing situation. So as Meredith said, you know, sometimes CapEx is the enemy of innovation. Uh, sometimes a one-off capital injection isn't sufficient. So getting an understanding of what you need to make something stick and work beyond the initial investment. So with regard to scale, um, look, a lot of people talk about digital, but the real benefit of digital is the fact that you can deploy it again with limited augmentation, you know, the cost of the next sale can be relatively cheap. Um, that only works if, if you have a scalable situation. So if we look at precincts, uh, not all places are the same, but the challenge for the sector is to find digital solutions that can be scalable regardless of the specific situation of the precinct. Uh, now in practice, how do you do that? There needs to be some type of aggregation, either uh, it happens at the place level, and I've got the example there of the Hunter Joint Organisation of Councils. That's the organisation that has 10 councils in the Hunter in regional New South Wales, and they can themselves organise what it is they're looking for from the market and go to market. Um, but then usually the sector, the smart city sector, that has a, a technology or a solution that they want to deploy they're, they're pretty hard pressed working out how they get it to the market. Are they trying to sell it to the government? Are they trying to sell it to an end user or are they trying to sell it to a business? Um, and in early days, it's before the market is established, this can be quite an onerous situation to find yourself in for both, both sides of the transaction. Um, often finding the path to the procurement um, and the path to the transaction uh, requires a lot of heavy lifting from a couple of small players. Um, and then once the transaction takes place, then others, others are able to benefit from that as well. So this, this slide here, we're talking about the role of government and in particular, I've, I've mentioned the role of local government. Um, for those who are not familiar with the New South Wales context, there's over 120 local councils in, in New South Wales. Uh, we have different models 
around Australia. Obviously, Southeast Queensland has larger councils um, being able to operate with larger budgets and larger geographies. Um, so that, that leads to two situations in the New South Wales context. One is you have uh, state governments that find themselves running services and infrastructure that in other jurisdictions would be done by the city, um, be it social housing, over 100,000 properties in, in New South Wales, um, schools, policing, roads, transport, some of these things, if we were talking about New York, they'd be part of the New York City conversation. So we have large sub-national um, capabilities, and we've also got quite small fragmented state government situation, uh, local government situation, sorry. So what can you do about it? Well, there's the opportunity to coordinate across those many local government actors. And I've given the example there of, of the Western Parkland City that most of you would be familiar with in terms of the Western Sydney City deal. They have their collaborate group between the eight councils. Um, and if they can coordinate and develop some standard approaches to approaching market, uh, they act as a, a regional procurement entity. Um, regulation, now, most people in the private sector hear regulation and cringe. Um, regulation can be a bit of a friend with regard to procurement and transactions if you get some type of standardisation and certainty. Um, so if you look at e-planning, and notwithstanding that e-planning is a government-led solution, but every council in New South Wales has to uh, adopt the, the Secretary's requirements as it relates to e-planning, the development assessment pathway that is now digitised. It means that you are creating a platform that will be used um, across the state and will lead to additional benefits going forward. I mean, it's the e-planning uh, solution that we have in New South Wales at the moment can quite easily be pivoted into a, a portal with, of transactions and communication and data services between the state government and local government, the state government and the professional services sector, the property sector, the local government sector and the community. It's um, quite a powerful opportunity. Um, procurement, obviously, local government, governments are buyers of, of products and services. Um, now, we've seen, I would argue, uh, the beginning of the smart city procurement process. Uh, it's happening right across government in the different sectors, be it in transport, uh, in education, uh, even in justice. If you look at some of the the audio visual links they have in the courts. So uh, I think you'll find that over time, you could retrospectively say that there's been a whole bunch of smart city procurement. It's just not badged that way right now. Uh, and then the solution development, this is probably the, the controversial part, and that is where government steps in and starts developing products and services themselves. Um, one of the examples I'll put down there is the Park and Pay app um, led out of uh, Service New South Wales. Now, arguably the development of a Park and Pay app uh, this is for car parking, is not the most complex uh, software engineering problem to solve, but uh, I'd put it to you that working with 120 councils to get it on boarded um, probably requires a bit of support, and I think the government's uh, taking that on. Uh, and there's a lot to be learned in how you aggregate and distribute some of these solutions across many places and precincts. So even though the private sector might look at that model and say, well, you know, we could do that, I think there's, um, there's a maturity there to work with government to understand how it's been deployed and how that can be replicated for other products. So the role of government, again, um, looking at when they get involved, and Meredith used the term market failure. Uh, generally, governments get involved when there's a perception of a market failure. I've just described that parking app situation. Sometimes the market failure is how you get product into market. Uh, the markets aren't as liquid as you'd think. Um, there's also the demonstration effect, and a lot of the, the smart city solutions that have been deployed in recent recent times are, you know, they've been pilots or demonstration projects. Uh, but the government itself has the ability to deploy technologies to demonstrate to the broader ecosystem uh, in some of their state-owned corporations. So I've put Sydney Water there, Landcom as a property developer. Uh, Landcom, the government's property developer, has a very strong and rich history in de-risking investments that the, the property sector then on board and deploy. Um, and then of course, we shouldn't be limited to state specific solutions or paradigms. Um, you know, these states are, 
they're just boundaries. Uh, there's no reason why you can't deploy something in New South Wales and Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria, um, particularly given that we have cross-border towns that operate as one region, be it Albury, Wodonga, or the Tweed uh, in South East Queensland. And a, an example there, I think that is probably understated is the way that we've all responded to COVID. Um, the data sharing arrangements with COVID, the collaboration between health districts and governments, um, for, for one of a better description, we've acted as uh, a federated health system across Australia, um, where whether you're in New South Wales or, or Queensland or Victoria or wherever you are, um, you're able to understand very quickly the situation in a particular state and the implications for you. Um, and then I've got an example here of, of Green Bee. I think there's there's a lot of um, a lot of good work that's being done in our local context. Uh, and Meredith, you mentioned the utility sector. Uh, Green Bee is a company that works with the utility sector. They're also working with the city of Newcastle, um, and they're looking at using um, nudges, behavioural economics, behavioural insights to help people understand their consumption patterns and. Um, be able to make savings and create value and benefit through how they change in, in near real time their consumption patterns. So there's there's a lot there. Um, in terms of the the government funding and buying models, uh, and again this is giving you insights into how government make their decisions to buy things. There's the you know buying something off the shelf conversation, which is pretty rare. I know this is the, the conversation that the private sector loves to have, which is I've got this product, I can sell it to you, it can meet the needs that you that I think you have. Um, but it's it's rarely the situation that the government is able to do that. Um, before you can establish markets and create sufficient competition so they can demonstrate that they're getting value for money. Uh, the other option which you see from time to time is governments subsidising the deployment of a particular product or service. Um, and I'd argue that the, the transport data hub in New South Wales and the way that the transport sector is engaging the, the software development community is a great example of that. Um, the data hub is it's open, the costs of administering that are absorbed by government to that extent and you know, subsidising the ability for the market to access consume and include these data assets in their own products, which they take to the market. Um, I think that's where you want to go. I think that's the role of government in terms of setting up these foundational and enabling assets so that the uh, the private sector can work with their customers. Um, and then grants, you know, controversially, I'm going to say that grants can be dangerous. Uh, they create a, uh, a false sense of security around some propositions that are not financially viable without the grant and they're not scalable. Um, I think there's there's a real need at the moment to have grant programs being targeted to demonstrate that these things can, these, these products and services can be maintained without a grant in the future. So a, a demonstration project that not, that doesn't look at the engineering elements, but rather the financial and economic benefits of particular interventions. Again, if you're looking at, at government, and this is um, largely to the, the private sector actors in the room, um, it's very rare that the government has a pot of money waiting for your great idea. Um, it's often the way that governments have already allocated money to particular, uh, to resolve particular outcomes or, or problems. Um, now I've got there on the left hand side, you know, solving something that's already a funded problem, like waste. Uh, the amount of people who are surprised when I say that, you know, on average 30% of a council's budget goes to waste management and collection uh, when they're talking about smart city solutions and they haven't thought about waste. Uh, so if you're looking to to offer a solution to a council and you're trying to think of where, where they have a problem that they can fund, waste is definitely a place to look. And more recently this week, the New South Wales government released their waste strategy for the next 15 years. Um, and then the, the other point that, that Meredith met, uh, mentioned around utilities, um, often when you have a user pays model, it's, it's, it's easy to demonstrate benefit and access a, a revenue stream. So whether it's car parking, water utilities, um, energy, and we saw a lot of this with water and power with the sustainability movement and the the green buildings movement, um, you're able to demonstrate that you can have good quality outcomes, savings with operating efficiencies, as well as um, will that offset the capital cost? Because the other thing that 
should be mentioned is that a lot of these smart city solutions require upfront expenditure and they generate their savings and, and benefits over time. Um, the word PPP come, or the term PPP comes up every now and then. Um, I, Jason may talk about it a little bit, but PPPs uh, have very defined connotations in the infrastructure and, and property development sectors. Um, I think when people talk about PPPs in the smart city space and, and precinct space, they're, they're really talking about partnering between government and industry, not necessarily a, a more traditional special purpose vehicle that transfers risk and has payments based on outcomes, um, which are quite, uh, quite, quite defined and expected propositions in the market. Um, and by way of example, my time at Infrastructure New South Wales, you wouldn't you wouldn't consider doing a PPP that had a sticker price less than two hundred million dollars to cover all of the legal and procurement costs that go with the PPP. So I think we should be very deliberate with the term. If we are talking about collaboration and partnership, we shouldn't let people um, form a view that we're talking about the former, which is that public private um, structuring of a transaction and the the allocation of risk to the party best able to manage it. Um, I will say though that the that last point there, the bigger the contract, the more interesting things, uh, whether it's longer period of time, more assets being thrown into the mix, um, upstream, downstream, the ability to derive value. So you find, and, and Meredith, your point around the Lyon um, command centre, you know, you do get some big transactions that some governments go to market for, um, but in our context, it's it's quite a risky endeavour at this stage. So I think people need to be realistic about that. Um, now, the industry sales model, if we're wearing the industry hat, um, you know, it costs a lot of money to develop products and it costs more money to sell it. So, you know, usually there's, there's a desire to, as quickly as possible, recover the expenditure that went into developing the product and getting it to market. Um, so, you know, people are either going for a big build for a big group. I'll just read out the boxes there. A big build that you can sell many times um, or a big build that you can sell on a per user basis. Now, a lot, again, in the in the, the smart buildings or the, the local government um, enterprise software solution segment, you know, you do get these big transactions, big builds for one-off situations and they're not scaled. Um, so again, in New South Wales, there'd be four, four or five providers of enterprise software systems for local government, but within them, if you had a look at them, they probably run about 19 to 20 different uh, enterprise solutions that are not necessarily scaled. And you're seeing that with e-planning. For those who aren't aware, um, one of the barriers to the rollout of e-planning is the interaction between the e-planning platform and council enterprise systems. Um, then if you're looking at you know, a big build that can be sold many times, I think that's the sweet spot for everybody. Uh, that's, that's trying to find a situation where you can sell to many precincts, um, be able to provide discounts because you're, you've got a, a large cohort of potential buyers, becomes more affordable, means the benefits realisation is easier to be um, achieved. And then the per seat, per user situation, I mean, that really is linked to benefits realisation again, um, and also the ongoing maintenance costs. So this point here is around, you know, the confidence of being able to sell something many times. Uh, you know, I think you, you wouldn't be surprised that there's a very strong link between these transactions and procurement methods, pathways, timeframes, and the expenses that incurred by the sector in, in engaging with government. Um, interoperability, it's, you know, it's been around, the, the conversation's been around as long as smart cities have been around. Uh, in early days, there were biases in the, in the private sector to, if you like, um, limit interoperability to have a stickier transaction and recover um, some of the, the benefits over, over a longer period of time because it was harder to pivot and harder to, to incorporate other solutions. And I think that's one of the challenges. I think the market will offer interoperability if we can find a way for them to scale. Uh, and that's something that I think government and the market need to be mindful of together. So moving, moving beyond the pilot, I made this reference when I was talking about the grants earlier on, not just engineering, but we need to look at Benefits realisation, so benefit identification and benefits realisation. Uh, 
and you know the the lean canvas that Meredith showed was fantastic. Um, you know, when you're doing something like this, why why are we doing it? Can we measure it? Can we measure the benefits that we're seeking to achieve? Um, and then the last question: Would you fund the outcome being realised on an ongoing basis? And I I think that is the tough question for the sector in Australia at the moment, because we have many point solutions, many interesting projects. Uh, we don't have many. I can't give you a portfolio of case studies that I've seen that says here are the, the 30 projects that have been delivered, that generated savings, those savings paid for the deployment, they've been scaled. Um, that's, that's, I think, the challenge for us over the next to 12, 18, to 12, 12 to 18 months. I think they are out there. I think they're able to be deployed and documented. I just think we've got to we've got to make sure that we work together to get that done, um, so that people don't pursue other endeavours, both government and industry. Um, look, this slide here is very much around once you've deployed and you've generated that first horizon of, of benefit. How do you make sure that it's you get that virtuous cycle? that the benefits get harnessed, they get reinvested, almost the, um, you know, the asset recycling that people talk about with the physical environment, it's almost benefits recycling in the, in the digital environment. How do, you, how do you harness that and get that virtuous flow? Um, you can't ignore capacity and capability, uh, and that's in the government sector and in the private sector. It's not just the, the capacity and capability of the product, it's the people who are using the product, maintaining the product, how it interacts with uh, systems within a, a government or council context, or even from a precinct perspective. Um, you know, if you look at a precinct like Macquarie Park, you've got multiple actors, universities, shopping centres, um, industrial landholders. How do they work together? How do they um, how do they find a solution that suits their needs but can be continuously funded, operated with people with sufficient talent to, to execute? So in terms of the, the takeaways, um, look, again, they, they're, they're there to be read. Um, we've got to go beyond engineering. I think um, someone said to me, you know, 90% of the code we're going to use in the next 10 years has already been written. Um, so it's, I don't think the challenge is developing the solution. I think the challenge is developing clarity on the problem to be solved that is able to be funded to be solved in a market that can be scaled so that we generate savings and efficiencies and can, can fund either more good things or other things. Uh, the importance of measurement and reporting and, and being able to have a legitimate business case in the first place. Uh, I think there's a, a maturity and a confidence that, and Meredith used the, the term, you know, failing fast, have the conviction to say that we're doing this because we, we want to achieve this outcome have a go at procuring and delivering and, and securing that outcome and be honest about the performance. Um, if we don't have that honesty, then we won't be able to improve. Uh, the third point there is um, taking the time for, for benefits identification and realisation. Um, there's never been more, more money in the sector in terms of liquidity. There's money looking for investable projects in the property sector, in the, in the IT sector, as Jason will say. You know, if a project has merit, it will attract funding. Uh, the role of grants, and um, I think we need to be channeling these grants so that they are helping develop benefits catalogues for new solutions and, and helping the, the sector become more mature and be able to operate without the grant. Uh, and then the role of government um, and government playing a role in overcoming fragmentation. I think you know, if, you, if you said to me, what's the one problem in the smart city sector, I'd say it's that fragmentation. And that's a it's a nature of the way that our economy is set up, our democracy is set up. You know, we have um, the good fortune of many different views, many different suppliers. It leads to competition and innovation. It also makes it challenging to have platform economics, and platform economics is so important in the smart city sector. Um, so they're, they're the key takeaways. Um, Kelly, I might throw back to you and see if there are any questions. I'm so glad, I'm so glad you, glad ended, you on ended on that, on that on last, point last point there, Michael, because um, that's the question I actually wanted to ask you. Um, <laughs> just you, you talked a bit earlier about sort of the, the um, consistency um, 
in solutions like park and play where the, the state governments played a direct role in putting in a consistent solution um, as well as enabling um, a variety of solutions through consistent data availability. Meredith talked about consistent approaches to building the business case with, with the lean canvas example. Um, what I'd love to know is in your time advising local governments, which which do have you know a real variety of of place issues, of communities, of services that they provide, of capabilities in the smart city space. Um, where is that balance between that local variation and the consistency that perhaps state government can bring? Um, where, yeah. where does that, where's that balance fit? Where's the opportunity? I think there's, you know, if we can take inspiration from IKEA, right? IKEA has a whole bunch of parts that are numbered. I think you can standardise components and allow people to use them flexibly, but you have a standard catalogue of components. You know, if every council will go to their community and they'll ask their community what their big issues are, and when it comes to a precinct, every community will say parking. Every community will say, I, I want to go to that place, but I find it difficult to park the car. And council will say, well, let's try and change that from parking to movement and let's talk about you walking and getting the bus and riding your bike. What people would benefit from would be a standard way to catalogue, describe and share mobility information. So we have that for public transport. We don't necessarily have that for footpaths, for parking controls, for um, on-street and off-street parking uh, availability. Um, so I think in that example where you might be in the Blue Mountains and your parking issue relates to tourism or you might be in Chatswood and it's about commerce or in Cobra and it's about going to the hospital, each of them have their own use case, but fundamentally they'd all benefit from a standard approach that said, when it comes to parking, here's how we all agree to curate that data. Here are the definitions. Here's how we'll share it. We'll share it centrally through the state government. And then if anyone wants to develop a parking solution, they don't have to worry about engaging 120 councils to make sure that the parking data is coming in the same way and going out the same way. So I think that's, that's the type of conversation that needs to be had where you can say to those jurisdictions, we can do this in a way where you can meet the needs of your stakeholders, but from a foundational perspective, we need to set it up so that it's logical and scalable. Brilliant. Thank you. That was that was such a great answer, Michael. Um, just just to give the audience a bit more of a chance to type any questions in there, there was one other thing I wanted to throw at you um, before we move on to Jason. Um, how do you think we can address those competitive barriers to interoperability and, and I guess I throw um, open data sharing into the mix there as well because that's something I've come up against in um, um, you know mobility as a service type type discussion yeah, yeah, it's hard it's really hard look I you know we we advise government and industry and we're also a small business ourselves and I'll, I'll share with the room we've talked about you know anyone can access the open data so what is our value add? Like if we're going to create additional value, we need to do something extra. So we've thought about doing a survey to insert additional data into the open data. And then we have this existential crisis where we say, well, do we give that survey out to everybody because we want to share it? And then we think, well, no, but that's that's part of the value proposition. And that's the challenge. So if you're, if you're creating an additional value on available information, which lots of data, either data providers or data analysts do, how do you motivate them to share it? Because they do incur a cost, like they're not doing it, they're not doing it um, because of philanthropic drivers, they're doing it to make money. So we have this, this situation where I don't know, and, and there's been a couple of attempts that haven't worked out. People have, you know, there's been marketplaces in Denmark to an extent. There have been private examples of this domestically. I don't know that the market is in a position yet where you can trade insights or, or additional um, data sets that would otherwise improve interoperability. So it's a tough one. I, I, I think it's probably a, a third horizon or fourth horizon play. I think if you try too early, it just won't work. 
So I think in the short term, it's about minimising harm. I don't think we can get rid of it. <laughs> but, you know, how do you through procurement say, look, we understand you need to recover your costs, but let's be reasonable about this. You get a period of exclusivity or you need to be able to have um, certain interoperable, interoperable characteristics. Watch this space, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Okay, uh, we will now head over to our third speaker, Jason. Um, Jason D'Souza is a group executive at Lendlease. Hey, Jason, with responsibility for data and communications infrastructure development and how these assets can create digitally connected and more productive cities. Prior to this role, Jason was director of major projects and specifically focused on originating uh, infrastructure projects, which delivered superior property and place outcomes. Jason's strength lies in his deep understanding of the intersection between business, market and public policy. Prior to joining Lendlease, Jason served in senior policy and leadership roles at both the state and, gov and Commonwealth uh, levels of government. Jason's also acted for public and private sector clients in Asia and Australia, Australasia, advising on public private partnerships, infrastructure investment strategy and regulation. He has a particular interest in how to unlock the potential of cities, focusing on how infrastructure and urban renewal projects can make cities more affordable, efficient and accessible and create value for public and private investors. Jason holds a Master of Business Administration from the Australian Graduate School of Management, a Master of International Relations and a Bachelor of Economics from Macquarie University. So uh, with all of that under your belt, Jason, uh, please uh, close us out with our, our third presentation. Thank you very much, Kelly. Can you guys see that? Uh, the slides up? Are the slides up? Yeah, it looks perfect. That's amazing. Look at that. So obviously with all of that introduction, operating slides might be something that uh, that I may have finally learned on Microsoft Teams. So has anyone has anyone had the experience at IKEA, by the way, that you always end up with things left over afterwards? Or is it just me? Yeah. So uh, this is you, Jason. <laughs> it's just me. OK, fair enough. So look, I'm going to try and provide a, a bit of a, a property lens or property developer lens or private sector lens after my counterparts, uh, Meredith and Michael, have provided both the business case side and the social impact side, and obviously how government treats for these things. So uh, I think it's safe to say from a development perspective, the the property sector and the construction sector generally, and certainly the asset lenders are very excited about uh, what smart technology is and what it can do in terms of efficiency and in terms of improvement of development outcomes. Uh, but I think we still have yet to work out exactly what the business model is, particularly when it comes to large scale public procurement and integration of the public good. And so that's something I'm going to try and address today. So um, if I go to the next slide here. So how do we actually view property development? Well, so this is a picture of Barangaroo. You can see here um, these new residential towers that are coming up here and the, uh, the Crown Hotel, the Crown Sydney Hotel. And so this obviously was a development procured in 2008. It had been planned probably a decade before that. Uh, it was declared an area for redevelopment under Premier Carr a long, long, long time ago, right? That was somewhere in 19, 1998 or something like that. And it's only now in 2021 that it's coming to some form of completion. There's still more to go. So what does it involve? Well, we've just talked about the town planning element of it. It's a long and arduous process. Then there's negotiation and land purchasing, which uh, is trite to say that is, is tough and trite. It, uh, it involves uh, significant forward thinking in terms of how you actually structure a commercial agreement and flexibility because cities change over time. And I think if you look at all of the major precincts that Michael referred to in his presentation, uh, one of the things that I think has never been anticipated is the pace of technological change and how you deal with that in a contractual framework. Um, then you get pre-purchasing, you get documenting and drawing it all up, you build it and then you have to manage it. And the management part, again, from a technology perspective, is now becoming more and more important because of the life cycle costs that go into actually managing the technology within buildings. So an example I always like to use is in each building, we have a, 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 an in-building coverage system that allows you to use your mobile phone on the, uh, on the 5G network, 4G network, um, and it's current today, 
But when we end up in 6G, and, and a quick plug uh, for the masterclass that's coming up on 6G, which I learned about earlier, um, I'd love to know how we're going to upgrade the DAS systems to cope with 6G, given a 5G one isn't available yet, right? So how do you embed that in a commercial model? Um, these are not answers that anyone has yet, and we at least, and, and many of our counterparts in the property sector are working on at the moment. So how are we actually approaching this problem from a from a digital technology level. So uh, Meredith, who is one of our greatest fans when it comes to our Podium uh, digital suite, uh, will be able to tell you that we are trying very hard to start to think about imagining things virtually and designing them virtually. So this is a product here that we call Envision. And what that really allows us to do is start to design and virtually scenario test what a building could be, not just in terms of the building itself, but also what's around the building. And that allows us then to integrate into the city appropriately from an infrastructure point of view, water, power, renewable uh, renewable power, if that's integrated into the precinct, recycling and waste, uh, to refer back to my, Michael's presentation on that, uh, to basically increase the capacity of the building to integrate properly into its, into its surroundings, but also of the building to be more responsive to people. And this is why we've really invested big time now in having our own digital capability, um, which is Podium. There's three elements to it as well that are past the scenario testing part, which is the automation part. We believe firmly that we're heading towards an autonomous building scenario, a building that could tell us when something goes wrong with it, tells us when there are maintenance issues with it, tells us when there are temperature changes that are making it less efficient, uh, tells us which floors are occupied well, which are not. Um, these are all things that we are progressing to in terms of what a AAA rated building would look like. And then outside of that is more on the construction and development side is the idea of an automated supply chain. So you'd be aware, for example, that you know most of a building has some 80% of it are common pieces. So could we substantially cut the cost of putting together uh, a very large development if we use standardized parts that were manufactured you know locally perhaps and could we do that from going file to factory from the digital twin to a set of suppliers using a standardized set of products and in fact to, to refer back to michael's lego analogy that's exactly what the beauty of lego is each block is interchangeable you can build lots of things with it and your imagination can go anywhere the beauty of lego is that it's each block is completely standardized to fit to another block, no matter where it is, anywhere in the world. And that's really what the power of, of digital offers the real estate and construction industry. But from a smart cities perspective, what it does is it really does allow us to start to integrate in a virtual setting what we think uh, broader smart technology could, could do. So everything from your parking app example, Michael, to uh, some of the social impact stuff that Meredith was talking about, uh, to other examples uh, like how you integrate your shopping habits, for example, or you know your mind can go anywhere on these things. So that's that's a quick idea of how we are approaching it. So a bit more on what that means. Well, what does a smart place actually mean when we talk about smart places and investing in one? Well, I've given you one example of an investment, which is how we're investing in the digital capability of it. But that's really about how we can make ourselves more effective as a property developer and how we can develop better places uh, for our customers and our shareholders. But what about if we're trying to create the public good and we're trying to improve that? How do you do that from a place perspective? Well, other than the digital twin, which you can see there in, in the first circle of graphic, you then get into this world of sensors and connectivity, which allows you to communicate with your broader customer base, whether that be the local council or whether that be the state government or whether that be the federal government or any other regulatory model, uh, body that you know might be involved. Um, and we're already doing that to some extent. The, the New South Wales digital twin, which is a spatial twin of the entire state, is already being designed for digital twins like Podium to integrate into it and then provide real-time feedback into how the built environment is performing in relation to uh, into the broader place and the broader state of the city. And what's really important about that uh, is if you then integrate that into a planning framework and you use e-planning, which uh, Minister Dominello is a big fan of and of course pioneered, 
that means that you could potentially speed up the whole planning process altogether. And the process of rezoning land, which is a you know a process that's really difficult and challenging, might be given a lot more clarity and transparency for the community if people can really quickly understand what the sort of built environment looks like and how it might benefit them and the community and therefore why it should be accepted. And that transparency is one of the great things we're lacking right now in the sort of uh, planning framework in Australia, I think. And of course, the last one, just drawing off that, is around communication and information to the community and to the public and to decision makers around what all of this means. So if you think, for example, of what an environmental impact statement does right now, usually it's several volumes long. It refers to one specific project. It doesn't really refer to any of the city around it. And you can't really understand most of it anyway if you were uh, not someone who was some uh, someone particularly trained in planning. What we want to do with this sort of technology and digital technology for a smart place is make it really clear and understandable to everybody because there is no reason why you should have to be uh, a planning specialist or any other type of specialist to understand exactly what the built form is and how um, it should really relate to you and your community or how as a government official or a decision maker what it should mean in terms of implementing your policy. So moving on a little bit further, we actually do have a vision for what a smart place is and why you would invest in it. And what we're trying to get to in all of the precincts that we work in around the world uh, is, and we work in 14 different cities, all of which have very large major precincts, like, like a Barangaroo, some in early stage, some in later stage, is really a city that delivers for citizens. And what does that actually mean? Well, the number one thing for us is sustainability. Right? More and more we're seeing that there is a demand from investors to have uh, carbon positive precincts. Barangaroo is a carbon positive precinct. Um, the Brisbane Olympic Games is, is designed to, is you know, one of their mandate points is that it needs to be a carbon positive games. So increasingly the property sector is going there. Um, socially accessible, I think that's become more and more important in terms of particularly in COVID, how we relate to one another, not just through technology, but in person, technologically connected, which I think is of great interest to this audience. And I like to always add this one in, which is commercially sensible. And Michael referred earlier to grants being a, a difficult thing to apply in terms of commercial settings. I tend to agree from a private sector perspective. I'm not a huge fan of grants. It's not free money. Uh, it is uh, it is difficult to account for it. It often it often creates the, um, the the wrong commercial signals, and you end up basically with a substandard product because you're trying to trying to meet a whole bunch of other objectives other than building what is a commercially sensible product that that delivers on those first three objectives. Um, I'm much more of a fan of equity. Um, if you're if you're going to be a government and you're going to invest in something and you want a policy outcome in it, I would much rather a government look from an equity perspective than a grant perspective, um, because it doesn't matter how strong your grant um, your your grant funding rules are or or, um, or framework might be. Um, commercial incentives are always set in terms of how you can get a return for your investment. And I, I've never felt that the taxpayer should view that differently to any other um, investment. You might you might choose, for example, that maybe you might take a, a smaller return or something like that. But certainly, you know, grant funding itself in this environment, I think, is challenging. Um, so some case studies. So it's it's great that we you know we've talked esoterically about things. Um, let's let's talk about an example. So what you've got here is the SoftBank headquarters at Takashima in Tokyo, a city I love well, and I I think some of my my colleagues and counterparts from SoftBank may actually be on this call, so welcome. I hope you guys are well and good luck with the Olympics. Um, you find here that the Takashiba precinct here um, has been deliberately designed by SoftBank to be the smartest place um, on earth because of SoftBank's belief in artificial intelligence as being the future of making life better for humans. And what they've really done is focused on a few things. Uh, traffic coordination, which in Tokyo is important, people movement, again, because of large populations. They've really gone hard on IoT. They've really gone hard on AI, being able to control the precinct and change things dynamically. Um, and they've also gone further as well on some really interesting things. Disaster prevention. Obviously, Tokyo uh, has had its fair share of disasters. If you're going to invest substantial amounts of money in a precinct, you want your population to be safe within it, and you want it to withstand um, 
disasters. And so therefore, um, smart technology can really help in terms of that. And uh, it, it it's quite impressive actually what they've done on that space. And the other thing is really interesting is virtual, the virtual reality capability of it. Their video conferencing facilities are beyond anything I've really ever seen in terms of this uh, this precinct, where it really is becoming more and more realistic uh, for you to be a hologram in a particular room. And uh, and that, again, is part of you know, the reason why they developed this precinct as a standout for why, um, why they do what they do, but also to show their customer base globally what they're trying to do. Now, the interesting thing with this is, this is commercially sensible for them because of the type of company they are and what they're trying to do. So while it's a great example, it's not necessarily the right smart cities platform example for every company. So one of the things we tell our clients is for if you want to be a smart technology company, you have to understand what your actual mandate is. What are you trying to do with your business? And let us tailor the technology element to suit your business and your business plan. So while this is a great example for SoftBank, it may not necessarily be a great example for Nestle, which might be a, a whole different kettle of fish, would be 5G virtual network type model, right? And, you know, and that's something we can discuss more in, in the questions. Um, so then let's take a residential example. Um, this is the Yarra Builder community that is a lend lease community in um, Queensland. It's warm there. It's a beautiful part of Queensland. Uh, it is one where we've really gone and tried to demonstrate to the local council and local council environments what you can do with a community when you integrate technology into it. So it's got its own fiber network. It has public Wi-Fi throughout the whole um, whole development. It has energy monitoring. It's got a smart battery that uh, houses can use to run their energy off it. It has electric car charging stations. This is a several years old. It already had those things. Um, and most importantly, during a time of drought, water monitoring and weather monitoring were critical. And we have pretty sophisticated sensors that have gone into there to do that. And uh, that has helped with water use. And it also has smart waste. So in other words, you've got bins who are there that can tell you when they're full or not full. Um, so sounds pretty good all around. Imagine a community that's this smart. The question is, what does all of this mean in terms of the commercial model for a local government? So one of the examples I tend to, to use is this is really great for the community that lives there. They get free car charging, they get free public Wi-Fi, they get um, uh, a lot of access to fiber that's free, but somebody has to pay for it. In this case, the developer paid for it. We did because we wanted to demonstrate the potential of bringing a residential community up to a smart standard. So, but the commercial model still has to be worked out there. And this, and it hasn't been in this case. The second thing is it also has to integrate with what the public sector does in terms of its own network and own management of these precincts. So when a development like this gets finished, it gets handed to the public sector. They then become responsible for the parks. They become responsible for waste management, all that stuff. In fact, they almost take waste management from day of opening. If you have a smart bin for some, for a reason and it tells you it's full, that's wonderful. But if you're running an analog network where the bins are only picked up on Thursday, does it really matter whether you know whether the, ball is, uh, the bin is full or not? It doesn't. So there is a, a whole piece of work here around the creation of public good from these assets uh, when you integrate them with technology and how government responds in terms of managing that public good post um, the handover of public assets to them. So another example would be if you have, uh, as we do in this thing, a public park that is on a particular smart watering cycle, and we put that technology in as a condition of the development application, everybody's really happy, it's really intelligent and smart, then the council takes that over afterwards, who pays for the life cycle costs of all of those sensors and assets and things like that? Does the council pay for them? Technically, yes, but are they funded to do so? Is their business model structured the right way for that? These go back to all of Michael's earlier comments in his presentation into how you integrate with the public and private sector. So what are the challenges as, as I see them uh, in terms of an investor in property and infrastructure? 
Um, so I, I, I boiled it down to four things, right? So number one thing is retrofitting. Um, so earlier we showed you Barangaroo 2008. The technology in Barangaroo is pretty good, but it's not the, the latest that's going into, for example, our circular heat tower. So you have to retrofit a lot of dumb buildings to be smart. And you've got to do that in a commercially sensible way. And I'm not going to tell you I have a, an amazing answer for that necessarily, but it's important to note that investors are continue, continually asking us how to do that. And as part of managing funds uh, for investors, that's a that's a problem we're going to solve because that's what you know we're being asked to do. So, how do you do that if you're a public sector agency and you own public assets? That's an interesting question we need to think about. Um, we talked a bit about procurement models. That's a picture of the New South Wales uh, Sydney Convention Centre, which um, is a uh, PPP with a residential development off the top uh, off the side of it. That was what we call a, co a collaborative dialogue. Um, uh, sorry, a competitive dialogue process, which meant that the tender process was step by step with the public sector, where we both worked out the outcome together, and then they picked one at the end. Um, it is one of the best run procurement processes I've ever seen for a major project um, because it was collaborative. And uh, I I put that up there because I think in terms of this whole smart question there is a avenue for that in terms of how we solve some of these questions about how do you integrate smart technology how do you solve some of the public good questions that are created by um, integration risk and life cycle cost right so once you jam all the technology in there and there are some nice logos of all the different tech companies how do you maintain them at the top standard how do you upgrade them you know there is a cost to that and often that is forgotten and last but not least, I'm a believer. So a lot of us on this call believe technology is the way of the future. Digital is the key to solving some of the big world problems. Um, not everybody feels that way. And so you find in with many decision makers in uh, positions of deciding yes or no on a procurement deal or otherwise, that the technology solutions for things often get rubbed out as part of commercial assessments. And you end up with a much dumber development than you possibly should have had, uh, which means that the outcomes are much poorer than they could be. So Michael talked earlier about this, you know, and uh, perhaps that was in his CV um, about the eight councils and Western Sydney and, and all of the opportunity out there. There is an inordinate amount of, of money going into infrastructure into Western Sydney. Prior to the pandemic, two out of three Sydney siders were moving to um, Western Sydney. It is definitely the biggest growing, fastest growing area of our uh, of our state at the moment. Uh, it's not just driven by the infrastructure itself, it's actually driven by the fact that it's a, it's a very nice place to live and people want to live in areas where they can access jobs. So more and more, um, there are going to be public-private partnership opportunities there that are driven by the development of infrastructure here. But I don't actually mean that in terms of the standard PPP model of buying infrastructure, I mean it in terms of local government and the development community coming together to try and solve some of these issues around how do we make sure that we get technology integrated in a um, in a sensible, flexible, scalable way to basically create the best uh, workplaces, create the best residential precincts. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about, about more about that now. So a few takeouts. Um, from this very quick presentation, because I'm, I'm keen to make sure people have a chance to ask questions. Um, there is a clear case for upgrade of automation in industry believes in its future. So I don't think there's any doubt that people believe that um, digital AI uh, has a, uh, a smart technology, has a key role to play in development and construction and in the way we create cities. Um, and I believe that most policymakers believe it has a future. But to actually make a city or precinct integrated and smart, you actually need a strong collaboration um, between the public and private sector to do it in a commercially sensible way. And this is where currently we're lacking um, that opportunity because we haven't quite figured out how to work with each other yet well on this stuff. And I must commend the New South Wales government because this particular initiative is trying very hard uh, to get people talking, get people learning, try and figure out some new ways of, do, of doing it. And, you know, uh, I think Simon Hunter 
uh, Rory Brown and colleagues have done a great job in actually now starting to push this issue more. Because if you don't push it, uh, you won't figure out what the problems are. And if you don't figure out what the problems are, you can't actually figure out how to treat. Um, the only way smart places work is if they are commercially sensible to run with low life cycle costs. Um, good technology alone is nice, but not enough. Uh, referring back to Michael again, endless vendors will tell you they've got the best technology in the world. It's amazing. Why don't you buy it? Um, that's fine. And there's lots of technology that's brilliant. The question is, once you integrate it, how do you run it? And once you run it, how do you run it for a long time um, at, with uh, you know life cycle costs that are acceptable to run on OPEX spaces? So it all comes down to dollars and cents and outcomes. It's not just, this is a really nice piece of technology. Why don't you buy it from us? Public good generated from a smart place needs to be clearly understood by the community, which ultimately bears its costs. Um, and I, I always find this an important one because in these discussions, the citizen are the ones who actually pay for all of us to do this stuff. Um, and it's not just, I don't just mean that as taxpayers, I mean that as consumers of, um, of any investable product. At the end of the day, the citizen is the one that decides uh, whether something is worth buying or not. And they exercise that decision in various different ways. But all of us need to understand that they are ultimately the ones who bear the costs. So we have to keep trying to figure out how to mitigate that cost for them, whether it be an obvious cost, an upfront cost, or whether it be one that is um, less transparent. Best outcomes will come from early collaboration with private sector stakeholders to work out, test and drive what is new and what works. And outcomes today must be able to be outcomes tomorrow. And by that, I mean that solutions must be flexible, scalable and adaptable uh, so that whatever we do today lives for tomorrow. Um, so I hope that is a, a quick round the grounds of how a, 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 from a property and construction development sector uh, view on how this smart technology could be applied. And uh, I hope you found that interesting and I look forward to your questions. Oh, that's great, thank you, Jason. Um, just to give everyone a bit of uh, time to type those questions in, um, I've I've got one. I guess I just would love for you to elaborate on. Um, Michael already talked a, a bit about you know, the difference between the the large scale capital P public private partnership, um, and and you've talked quite a bit about sort of collaborative procurement, early collaboration. Um, I guess in the in the absence of all that formal scaffolding of a of a big P PPP, um, how how can I guess realizing that a lot of smart solutions are being rolled out piecemeal rather than you know big whole smart cities how can local governments and and place owners tap into that early collaboration what what are some success stories that you've seen that's a great question i i think the it's a bit early to say what success stories are um because i think we're really just learning what all this means um my advice to local government when they've asked me this question has been you got to be very clear on what your outcomes are what do you actually want your citizenry to have what do you think is important to them is it is it better roads is it waste that's picked up three times a week is it you know what do you think your citizenry wants and then on that basis when you rezone land when you um, set out your um, set out your LEPs, you can then specify those outcomes and allow developers to come back with solutions on how to meet those outcomes. So at the, at the moment, the way we do things is quite, it, it's based on population sizing. So we'll say, we want X number of people to live here, therefore we'll have roads and therefore we'll have schools and therefore we'll have, you know, we'll have this and that. And the funding for that may come later, but we're going to provide these things over time. I think we need to do the same thing in terms of our citizen based outcomes. What do we think people need? What makes life easier for people living in, you know, local government area X or Y? And why is that any different to the people living in the adjacent uh, local government area or the one after that? Can we scale together? Can we have five councils to degree like this? Can we all have consistent standards? So that's certainly the way we've argued it. Now, in reality, that's not an easy thing to do. Democracy says that, you know, you have different uh, different views on what that means for, for community to community. But we are seeing increasing examples of councils working together. And the, the eight Western Sydney councils, I think, is the first example of that. 
That's great. Thanks, Jason. Um, look, I, my apologies to Teresa and Adam. I just realised the chat has not been giving me notifications, but there have indeed been some messages in the chat. So I might just cycle back to Teresa. Um, did you did you want to come off mute and, and just uh, raise out loud the, the comment that you made? Hi, hi. Hope you can hear me. <laughs> it, yeah. it actually is a is a nice extension. The original question I asked, and first off, thank you everyone for your presentations. Um, I'm I'm going to stay off camera just because the bandwidth here is limited. My house is not quite smart enough to allow audio and visual, so <laughs> I'm not trying to hide. Um, but uh, um, in a way, the question I had for Meredith is also a nice segue to what you just mentioned, Jason, because I'm I'm really interested in. The point Meredith made about the growing recognition about the value of participatory design and co-design practices. And so my question to her was, was about the ways that citizen-led input uh, can be a part of establishing the, the social value when you're putting together the business case. And you just mentioned just then thinking about, well, what do citizens want and need? And my immediate question then is, well, how can we actually you know, recognizing the challenges of, you know, the more people you ask, the more opinions you get. But um, I guess it's open to to both of you um, and Michael as well, is how how then recognizing the importance of, of demonstrating true value to citizens, do we go about actually practicing what we preach and starting to involve citizens more actively in these processes? So thank you. Meredith, would you like me to start or would you like to? Um, what I can probably do is just rattle off a couple that I was mentioning in the chat if you want and then go to you for a sort of more nuanced. Right, sounds good. <laughs> um, so, Cherise. Um, I like how you associate me with the nuance, but anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, so look, I think um, deliberative governance and particular. Uh, participatory democracy and citizen engagement itself is just having an utter renaissance. You know, things like um, citizen juries have been around for a long time, you know, where a local government might assemble, any government really, might assemble a collection of representative humans um, from the community to discuss and, um, you know, tease out certain ideas with them so that they get a good understanding of different perspectives in that sort of qualitative manner. But, you know, deliberative democracy is is different from rep representative democracy in particular. Um, and deliberative democracy really involves smaller groups and it's like quite prescriptive and it allows people to like consider things at depth. And I mean, you know, Melbourne, Sydney, like most councils in Australia are doing this to some small degree at the moment. But when it comes to smart cities in particular, I think participatory democracy is really, governance, sorry, is quite interesting because it really just utilises spaces and opportunities for deliberation between community members and other stakeholders um, that could be physical or digital, in-person or gamified, so like immersive, etc. And it really allows us to sort of turn our mind inside out and to consider problems from all sorts of different perspectives, you know, not just the classic digital twin. And I realise it's sort of ironic to be calling digital twin classic these days, but, you know, um, things for like, immersive participation for people with disabilities so that they can actually try or like, you know, um, visualise themselves in spaces and discuss the design outcomes or similar for, you know, elderly, et cetera. Um, in terms of data, particularly really quickly, just some of the big international best practice examples are um, that Barcelona in particular has like some really good um, an online platform for collective learning and adaptation called Meta Decium. Um, and they also do... Um, so both Barcelona and Tel Aviv also then take that one step further and they take the data from the deliberative platform and use that to incentivise behaviour with their own sort of urban currency, if you will. So if you participate in this, you get a credit for that and then you can do this and it could be parking, it could be coffee, whatever. Um, they have, there's a, there's a, there's a very famous visualisation cave in a place called Herringberg um, in Europe. Um, and Philadelphia mirrored that with an immersive street installation to help them um, reimagine how they might do the city. Um, and then other things like um, Make London, who has like civic crowdfunding programs where they allow the public to come up with ideas and then the public vote on these ideas. And the ideas that have the best amount of votes, then the government will co-fund it and that type of thing. And then the other big one is, of course, um, Better Reykjavik, um, which is a sort of more structured stakeholder engagement type actual voting type platform. 
that's the global piece. But over to you, Jason, for the sort of domestic piece. Well, that yeah, I mean that's that's a great um, <laughs> that's a great segue. I mean, from our perspective, the, you know, Mary mentioned the digital twin. The beauty of the digital twin is that it allows you to run many many types of scenarios. So what we're finding is that we're going to start using that as a means of integrating in citizen feedback into a development we might be proposing. Because you remember that the, the the it's on the developer to get the Department of Planning to approve a major precinct. It's not on the Department of Planning to approve the major precinct. So we have to prove that the thing we're putting forward is, you know, is worthwhile from sustainability, safety, integration with the city, does it have an economic impact, a positive economic impact, you know, all these sorts of things. What so what the digital twin allows in, in an analog world, what does that mean? You go, you rent a hall, you sit down, you have eggs thrown at you for a while, you know, and then basically you say you've consulted. That's not real consultation, other than the fact that you're covered with egg, right? Um, so what the digital twin allows is allow you to basically say, all right, throw it, throw in your comments. We can then actually use that as data points to then say, well, OK, 957 people have said the same thing. That's obviously a legitimate view on the proposal. So we can adjust to meet that particular perspective. So one example I like to use, for example, is schools. So schools are the most consulted on thing in any society because you know children are the future. Everybody loves a school. It's the most important community asset. And so the Department of Education has one of the toughest jobs anywhere in the world because they decide to build a building that's the most important thing to everybody, a school. Um, and it's pick up and drop off point, it's noise, it's child safety, it's, you know, it just goes on and on. The digital twin gives them a, a, a means of, of, of citizen engagement that was never there for them beforehand. Right? You know, so you, you've gone from the whole model or write to your MP or you know, read 9,000 pages of planning material that Michael used to write. Um, to uh, to now actually being able to virtually see something. I'm sure it was very, very understood, Michael, when you wrote it. Like just very, very clear and transparent stuff. Um, and so that's basically what the smart technology offers us as a way forward. And I'm, I'm willing to bet Michael has something to add to that as well, because <laughs> there are council, many councils leading the way to... with that participation yeah, in the okay. democracy model. Um, I think we got to remember that the community and the customer is often the same person, just in different contexts. And the um, this is where industry does this all the time. Um, they're constantly iterating, constantly getting feedback, improving, running new versions of products. You know, that's why we get Apple software updates all the time. Um, so I think the, the promise here is how do you scale that continuous improvement cycle and you know the, the human centered design used in digital development how do you scale that into some of the social benefits and uh, I think I think the government can learn from industry in this space um, so yeah I think the the other thing is to probably call out some of the the use cases that are non-financial so safety security um, you know, air quality, some of these things that are very much a public good and aren't transacted in with with regard to utilities and other customer costs. Thanks, everybody. Um, we've also got a comment there from Adam, which I had overlooked. Adam, would you like to uh, come off mute and mention that? Uh, Kelly, thanks for that. It was just a quick question about monitoring and reporting progress and having a culture of that. Uh, I mean, we certainly um, are good at reporting in PDF format every three, six, 12 months after the event. If we're truly to realise the opportunity of embedding social value, as Meredith mentioned, I, I would imagine we've got some work to do on building sort of more dynamic ways and a, a more robust, transparent culture of reporting progress. I was just keen to link those uh, comments between Michael and Meredith and would, would, would certainly be interested in their comments on where they think our performance is at with respect to monitoring and reporting. Are we a global leader? Is there room for improvement? All of the above. 
Can I start by telling you a story, Adam? I'd love to, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the day when I worked in the Department of Planning, um, there was there was a target for zoned and serviced land, and then, then a decision was made to um, change the definition of zoned and serviced land because we weren't meeting the target. And I think that's the... That's the challenge in terms of the maturity of, of the ecosystem. You know, you need to be able to hear bad news and do something about it instead of changing the news. And I think that, I think we're at the point now where um, that maturity is in, in the community because people, I think there's a fair amount of frustration in government, in industry, in terms of how long this has taken. We're lagging behind in some contexts. We're doing well in others, but... I think by and large, people want to do more quicker. Uh, I think that we can start having this conversation now to say, let's let's get some visibility, transparency. And if there is news that's unexpected, let's respond to the news instead of trying to bury it and, and similarly not politicising it. I think it ends up going all the way to the top because people don't want this to be something that's perceived as a political risk. So I think if everyone in the room shares that view, it makes it safer for people to do that monitoring and reporting. Can I add on to that, Michael? Yeah, Looking at the screen, sorry. <laughs> so Adam, your question was around, you know, is measuring it going to, you know, produce different behaviours, basically, I think, by reading between the lines there. And I think going on from Theresa's question around participation, it, it's... You know, you can measure outputs and obviously you want to design the program so that you can measure the outputs, right? And I would point to, you know, OpenGov, the ability to, you know, do transparent budgeting um, and arguably participatory budgeting as well. And you know, that is ultimately something that drives government behaviour internally if they know that every single line item is going to be a transparent online transactional thing. So that's like an internal sort of accountability thing. But then, you know, when we're talking about using things like participatory governance or, you know, um, for to, to generate more social value, I think we move towards the end of, of crowd surfing, crowdsourcing, crowd surfing, <laughs> both crowdsourcing ideas. So I think it does need to be a fine balance between the tail wagging the dog and the dog wagging the tail, if that makes sense. Um, and, you know, like a lot of the inputs that you get from participatory governance is going to be subjective. Um, as well, whereas I think, you know, as long as we're using evidence-based, like, data to design programs and benchmark programs and measure programs, then we're going to be in a much stronger spot. But it's just acknowledging that there's different there's different inputs to both of those things. But I think we need – I do think we need both. I don't think you can rely on one or the other. Thank you both for that response. That's great. Um, Teresa's got her hand up as well. Teresa, did you want to say something else? Uh, that's only if there isn't another question. It was just a follow on from what was just said, but I'm, I'm mindful there might be other questions, so I can hold back. We have none in the queue, so over to you, Teresa. Well, that's lovely then. <laughs> uh, I, so thank you for, for the comment you just made, Meredith, because I, the, it strikes me that the, particularly because you're, what we're talking about here with smart cities are data and digital technologies that require a level of competency and capability. And it's hard enough to get that amongst people doing the development work. And so the your general citizenry is going to have um, very diverse levels of skill and awareness and understanding. And I'm just curious how the literacy piece might fit into this. So where where there might be an opportunity because I think both, I think the monitoring and the evaluation and the transparency, I think that does go hand in hand with, with hearing from as many possible voices as possible. Uh, and especially when access to data and digital is not even, using normal digital means to hear what the general population wants. And, and it's like, I love the immersive examples that you gave, but if you can't have access to those technologies or if you have limited Wi-Fi, you're not you're not a part of those conversations. So it it strikes me that one of the things we've seen recently is that the the inequities that exist in a lot of communities are breeding some of the um, 
some of the social challenges that that mm. exist. So I'm just curious how how education and um, development might fit into some of these these issues as well. So it's not about smart cities, but that does feel like a social value that needs to be a part of it. Well, Therese, I would probably say that I think literacy is a challenge both for the general public as it is for, you know, the people doing the work internally, whether that's developers or government. Um, but that's why citizen juries and public using public spaces for immersive technologies can make them much more accessible so people can can come in or, you know, there's a funny example of a mayor in America who had a ginormous cardboard cutout of a mobile phone made, like, like a, a larger than life one, and he like physically took it to elderly homes to teach people and to encourage elderly people to use a smartphone himself because he was like, I can't do a smart city project if my you know, constituents can't use it. But I think that um, capability and that literacy piece internally inside government is a bigger blocker than anything before. We're here today to talk about public-private partnerships and investing in smart cities. And, you know, I, I called out how there's like an absolute daft of guidance or policies that are available that actually help us to address both data and infrastructure in, you know, in the same document. But equally, and the one thing I didn't touch on because obviously I crammed a lot into 15 minutes, was we're not also not talking about the length of time a public-private partnership is. So, like, let's say 10, 15 years if you're lucky. And retrofitting those. So you think about the number of public-private partnerships that are out there, already structured, already established, that have clear metrics, clear deliverables, clear payment cycles that have been utterly disrupted by technology. So we know that technology is going to be exponentially changing. So when if we're going to write public-private partnerships now, now and we don't build in principles-based clauses to enable all parties to be able to augment, adapt, iterate in the future, we are locking ourselves into crazy town. That's my... And that comes down to literacy, I think, internally. But anyway. F favorite phrase of the session, I think, Meredith, locking ourselves into crazy town. <laughs> Michael or Jason, did you have anything you wanted to add there? Jason, you go first. I'm not sure I can top that. So uh, I, I think I'm going to sip that one out. <laughs> Over to you, Michael. See if you can. Yeah. Kelly, I might, um, I might just draw on the relationship between the city and assets and digital and the role of libraries. I think that, you know, libraries have the potential to be a place that um, engages in physical and digital and capacity building. Um, and I think that there's a role, again, for the state government to work with the local government sector to help um, promote digital inclusion and um, provide access to devices. So not just the capability, but, you know, accessibility. Um, and most of the libraries are in need of a, a bit of a refit now anyway. So it's a, it's a good time, good time to do it. Can I just say as a trained librarian, I applaud that, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> I love that there's always one around. That's wonderful. Thank you, Teresa. <laughs> All right. Well, we've got five minutes left. So look, I, I just want to thank our three presenters. I what I've loved about today's session is that, you know, we've we've been talking about money and investment in technology and really everything we've been talking about is people. So the, the biggest factor in investment in smart cities is is very, very analog. Um so, you know, the, the focus really is on defining that value up front and doing so by engaging everyone along the way in a meaningful way, not by having eggs thrown at you, uh, <laughs> that, that we really need to take advantage of that role of government as, as regulator um, and, you know, provider of consistency and of funds directed towards the right things to, to learn, to fail fast, to build towards scalability. Um, and, and that technology can't do everything like smart relies on collaboration. It relies on capability and capacity. Um, we need a lot more uh, collaboration and it really comes down to what we are doing with the technology, which is right back to that business case. So thank you, the three of you, for, for taking us full circle. Um, I, just three such different perspectives all telling the same story. It's it's quite heartening from a <laughs> government perspective. Um, and this will this will lead us really nicely into that summit. So thank you all. Um, 
I, I hope everybody on the line is registered for the summit and we'll we'll see you online um, or in person, depending which audience you're in, on Tuesday. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe there will be some links posted in the chat for the uh, presentations and so forth, um, as well as registration for upcoming um, masterclasses. And thank you, Kelly, for hosting. I hope everybody has a wonderful evening. Thanks again.